morning, California. Good morning, Washington. Good afternoon, Kiev. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, USUBC uh, seminar. Um, my name is Morgan Williams. I'm the moderator. Uh, I've been the head of USUBC for 13 years. Uh, we started 1995, uh, so we're 25 years old this year. We have over 200 members. We're very pleased to uh, to have a very distinguished panel today. Uh, first, we have Andrew uh, Kolonofsky, a Senior Vice President, uh, Global Operations, Global Logic in San Jose, California. Then we have Alexei Chopisky, Advisor to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture. And then we have Dr. Chris Singh, the President and CEO of Holtec International. And we have Van Yider, Vice President of Cargill in Washington, D.C. We're very pleased to uh, have as our honor guest today the Minister of uh, Economic Development, uh, Trade and Agriculture of uh, Ukraine. Ihor, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, when we met last November, uh, you didn't you kept some secrets from me. You didn't tell me what all the plans were and that you were going to be uh, the Minister of Economic Development this year. Uh, you have a very big area that you're covering uh, with economic development, trade, and agriculture. You're very experienced in this area, uh, in all of those areas in terms of your previous work. And so now we'd like to have you uh, make your presentation about uh, what's going on in this area, what the ideas are for the future, and what your uh, observations are about how you and your ministry and your uh, uh, area to promote economic development, trade and agriculture in the whole government will be moving forward. So, Ihor, thank you very much. Uh, take mm -hmm. it away. Uh, yeah, thank you, Morgan. Thank you for uh, being uh, for having this opportunity to speak to such a large audience. Uh, I always enjoy the events uh, you organize and put together because they are great and uh, they are very informative and uh, interesting. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, the uh, participants, the, the investors and uh, other uh, participants on the call. Uh, as well for being interested in Ukraine and uh, being uh, investors in uh, different sectors are considering investing uh, in Ukraine as well. Um, the uh, special thank to also international uh, financial institutions uh, who are supporting Ukraine uh, throughout difficult times and uh, we uh, recently, uh, we, we've seen yesterday that there was a passage of this uh, legislation. Hopefully, actually, this will unfroze the uh, further cooperation with uh, IMF and uh, mm. uh, other institutions there. So we'll start uh, with a um, brief introduction, right? So we'll, we'll do like five, maybe 10 minutes, and then we do a, 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 a call session, Morgan. How would you like to, to do this? Maybe, uh, is right. Okay, I will. I will. I will, I will, I will do uh, introduction like for five ten minutes. Speak about the the, the goals, and then we'll go forward. Uh, then, uh, so um, I started as a minister like two months ago, and uh, obviously Ukraine, uh, as we all uh, see in different countries, are facing similar challenges uh, because of this new uh, coronavirus uh, event uh, which we have globally there and although this was kind of expected when we spoke to international uh, experts community last year all uh, were saying that there should be economic crisis coming but nobody knew what will be the reason so now we know that the reason can be not only economic related uh, but uh, can be also health uh, related and uh, this is the first crisis which uh, have very significant differences from uh, the previous ones because this affects uh, the, the, the uh, supply chains across uh, the world and uh, affect uh, the uh, relationship that people and businesses uh, have and uh, how we uh, communicate how we uh, right now we also having like the uh, lots of uh, communication uh, uh, 
channels, new uh, like Zoom webinars and other platforms, uh, which we will be using, I think, uh, more and more often, even coming back to uh, normal life. And the question uh, which we are people discussing, whether the life will be uh, the same uh, after the coronavirus as it uh, was, or it will change. But speaking about the economy, so obviously Ukraine, even last year, uh, had very ambitious goals uh, to uh, uh, recover economically and to start growing. So we have been expecting uh, and counting on a significant investments and uh, we need uh, uh, billions and billions of uh, new investments in order to modernize economy, in order to reform uh, the sectors and uh, provide our people with uh, decent uh, jobs and uh, decent salaries and uh, position Ukraine as a stable international partners there. So our uh, macroeconomic department in the Ministry of Economy did some uh, rough calculations uh, suggesting that uh, if we need to grow, if we want to grow like seven or eight percent, we need uh, uh, that uh, new investments and loans into the uh, system uh, every year uh, of 400 billion grivnas plus, so which is uh, about 15 billion dollars per year if you want to achieve this um, uh, this ambitious goal. So uh, the uh, crisis, uh, coronavirus crisis made some adjustments. So now we are uh, hoping that uh, the um, the worst is over there. So and uh, most countries as well as Ukraine, we learned to uh, fight it and to live with that. And uh, Ukraine, uh, I think, done uh, quite well in terms of the uh, government response to uh, those challenges. And uh, we have one of the lowest uh, growth rates uh, in Europe uh, and in the world. Uh, and our handling of the crisis and the uh, how people actually responded uh, is quite well. Obviously, the people get tired and businesses get tired from the uh, uh, closure of normal activities and uh, this is quite expected but uh, we have started easing up the restrictions and uh, because of medical already uh, reasons and uh, we do see that uh, that the, the economic activity should rebound rather quickly in the coming months and uh, we are trying to do all possible to uh, support it so uh, now we uh, are trying to put um, uh, robust but realistic targets as well. And uh, there are several opportunities that we, uh, as Ukraine, can, uh, uh, can have given the outcome of, uh, of, 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 of the recent periods there. And uh, what we specifically are interested in, potentially in repositioning Ukraine, uh, on a global international area uh, in trade and uh, in production. So uh, we all know that Ukraine has been a reliable uh, partner in the uh, agriculture uh, trade and uh, we are uh, number in, in top three uh, global uh, trade uh, providers, exporters of uh, agricultural products and the food security, I think, will become even more important with the specific on uh, reliable infrastructure, uh, which um, we can also uh, participate and uh, contribute to. So uh, we've the decisions that the government made uh, in the trade area, I think, proved uh, that uh, we are can I actually close that. I'm just sorry because I have a phone ringing. Prosto, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, Yeah, uh, so um, we, I think, as, as Ukrainian government, we made uh, decisions that did not close the trades, although there have been different pressures. Uh, uh, also from neighboring uh, examples when uh, the countries who uh, traditionally trade or export uh, goods started to close their supplies because they were starting to fear about the 
uh, local uh, food security there. We have been here, I think, quite uh, open and transparent. And uh, the memorandum that we had, uh, market memorandum with main traders, including international traders, Cargill, and, and, and others uh, balanced the market there and provided uh, visibility and uh, ability for uh, the international uh, and global uh, buyers and uh, traders to rely on uh, us as a, as a continued uh, uh, reliable uh, provider of, uh, of food. So this is one area where we can think uh, reposition uh, in the food uh, security area. Second is uh, obviously there are many uh, discussions right now of uh, international companies uh, may be repositioning their uh, production, uh, rebalancing, I would say, the production from uh, countries like China to uh, uh, local countries or uh, Ukraine in particular. And uh, this is something which we uh, also hope to uh offer the conditions for international investors that uh, they will be considering ukraine uh in, in this direction uh, as well uh we uh, continue uh, to focus on uh, further building on our reforms and the institutions there uh and um we obviously looking for uh attracting and retaining like the talents uh, who can uh, make uh, the changes and make the differences this is a, a, not an easy task, but I think we will be uh, um, we will be successful uh, in that. Uh, um, also, uh, uh, we need uh, to continue a process of modernizing our economy there because Ukraine has been uh, underinvested in many of the key sectors there, and uh, we want to uh make sure that the ukrainian companies uh get access to the credit and financing that uh, they will be allow them to uh invest and to grow uh their production assets and uh, their um, uh, uh, operations in ukraine and this is not only by ukrainian companies i mean all companies that are uh, work in ukraine all international companies uh, that have businesses in Ukraine, all local uh, companies that are uh, owned by Ukrainians there or by international players. So we will uh, commit and we are committed to uh, work uh, and uh, participate in the global trade and uh, as well as uh, we value and, and, uh, um, uh, and seek like the, uh, and seek uh, more and more uh, cooperation from uh, our uh, existing and, and, and new partners. Uh, as to like specific maybe priorities, obviously land rep reform uh, has been voted and I think this is a remarkable and uh, uh, remarkable uh, achievement uh, which uh, Ukraine was going to for many, 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 many years. And there are some disappointments maybe with uh, the size and the approach for that, but uh, I personally think that this is a great step and uh, nobody could do this before. So this is the first time the parliament has been able to vote and open the market. Yes, the market will open in uh, some period of time and there is still restriction on the legal entities, but this is still temporarily, temporarily and uh, the main uh, step has been taken. Now there are different additional legislation which are in the parliament. Some of them are voted, some of them are not yet, uh, which uh, are important in order for the land reform to open and uh, to, uh, uh, to um, be effective and to benefit uh, the country uh, and, uh, and, and the international community. Uh, also, important thing is private-public partnership, and this is pretty much the only way to uh, do the large uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, we hope to get uh, investors uh, into those uh, areas, the building roads, ports. There are several successful examples uh, already as a start examples there, but uh, we hope that this will be enough to open uh, this uh, very under-invested area in Ukraine for the international community. Uh, um, obviously, some um, areas like reforms in uh, the transportation, like Ukrasaliznitsa, is very important. There has been talked for many, many years. 
uh, but uh, I think we are uh, at the uh, time right now when uh, this can be possible and can be done. Um, and um, uh, the maintaining uh, talented people in Ukraine is also an important priority. So we uh, will hope to create uh, the conditions uh, when the Ukrainian companies and international companies who want to work and invest in Ukraine will be growing fast, will be happy with the uh, market conditions, will be happy with the uh, regulatory conditions. And uh, this is also a very important uh, priority uh, for us as well. Um, um, the one thing which I will, would like also to uh, to point out is the uh, Ukraine Invest. It's an area. It's it's uh, in, in the uh, organization which is created under Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine and has been created by uh, so sometime uh, earlier there by uh, um, uh, Dan Bilak was an active participant in that. Uh, then uh, he's not uh, working uh, there for for some time already, but. Uh, we want to uh, provide a new, uh, uh, new fresh air into the, into their work because they, uh, the the idea uh, this area this agency was created was to help international uh, companies uh, who wants to work in Ukraine to establish and to navigate through the different uh, information. Uh, uh, challenges like regulatory uh, institutions and others. And for Ukraine Invest, I'm happy to, to announce that Alexa Chipivska uh, uh, has joined uh, as a member of the uh, board uh, of the uh, supervisory board as well. And uh, we hope that in the coming weeks, uh, this Ukraine Invest will become um, uh, very active again. And uh, all people who are on the call, who have questions about Ukraine and uh, uh, who wants to work in Ukraine, who are working in Ukraine already, uh, can work and get support from this agency in, 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 in the appropriate format. Um, so uh, I'm happy actually to, to welcome Alexa to uh, our team and uh, she will help to facilitate communication between the international business community from the US and other places. Uh, uh, with myself and the ministry and other institutions there. Um, that's probably for the introduction uh, there. Uh, so I don't take all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, as you know, agribusiness is an economic engine out there. There's been a lot of restrictions on what businesses could do under this time. Uh, what has been done or what are you planning to do to make sure that uh, that farmers uh, get all the fertilizer, seed, uh, equipment, fuel that they need and the planning can continue and exports can continue and, and there not be very many restrictions on doing agribusiness because nature doesn't stop and we got to make sure that uh, agriculture can move ahead and there's not unnecessary restrictions Mm -hmm. uh, imposed upon agriculture. So what uh, what have you done or what can be done to make sure that uh, the crops all get planted, uh, grain continues to move uh, into international markets and we keep that economic engine open and, mm -hmm. and uh, not have it uh, shut down unnecessarily. So what, what, what are your comments in that area to keep agriculture moving ahead? Yeah, uh, uh, sorry for this background. There are phones which are ringing all the time. So one uh, 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 specific being a minister that we have different phones there so they can ring uh, from time to time. The, uh, so uh, sorry for that, uh, if it actually interrupts. But um, yeah, thank you for the question. Obviously, the, 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 uh, the position that the ministry has on that, that we want to have as little restriction as possible there, and only those which uh, are necessary in order to uh, provide and guarantee uh, food security. I, I'm sorry, just give me one second there, because I think the, the, somebody is calling very persistently. All of you know that the minister has been very involved in agribusiness and he's an expert, 
expert on exporting eggs and uh, grain and right. lots of other products. So uh, uh, go ahead, Minister. Yeah, uh, so uh, the position is actually to have as little restriction as possible at the same time to guarantee food security. What we have done in Ukraine was, I think, very uh, good and uh, positive there. So first of all, uh, we maintain like the continued supply in the Ukrainian uh, shops and everything. And at the same time, we have not limited international trade. So all grain, which was expected to be exported, uh, if we're talking about grain, was exported there. So we have not closed the markets there. We uh, agreed with the traders to limit uh, voluntarily the amounts, which is okay, obviously, there, because we need to have a minimum uh, uh, level uh, before the new harvest comes in. And uh, what we are talking, if we are talking about the, 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 the this year harvest, so obviously, we do different uh, analysis there. And uh, it is expected uh, to be lower than uh, last year. So how low it will be, uh, still a, a question there. But we think Ukraine will have about 65, 68 million tons of grain uh, from 78 last year. And uh, we uh, plan so far to use the same approach as this year, to have a, an agreement uh, with the main traders there in the format of memorandum that will provide them uh, with visibility on uh, the trades and not moving with quotas or any uh, like administrative restrictions there. So this is the first important thing. Uh, we are discussing right now of uh, using um, uh, more actively uh, some traditional uh, um, uh, resources like uh, uh, grain interventions, maybe at some period of time in the future, but this is still something in, in, in discussion. So uh, for the current uh, uh, sowing campaign, uh, the, uh, we, we, we do have uh, pretty much uh, bi-weekly uh, calls with the uh, Ukrainian agricultural companies, producers, traders there, and uh, they all have fertilizers, uh, Morgan, to your questions, the uh, crop protection and everything, so they are well supplied. Uh, the issues that they are, they are facing is uh, droughts in the southern uh, parts of Ukraine and uh, the weather conditions have not been great and uh, some of those areas have been uh, affected there. Uh, so we hope somehow to uh, help and uh, the most uh, the areas which uh, have been hit uh, most there. So but generally uh, the approach is to maintain uh, trade open at the same time uh, making sure that uh, there will be enough uh, food uh, 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 in Ukraine, uh, uh, per se. Uh, international investments, uh, as you know, uh, moving energy forward. Uh, I know it's not in necessarily under your area, but you're uh, to be the major promoter for economic development. Uh, a PSA program was approved a year ago. No contracts have been signed. No international companies. Uh, or in Ukraine exploring and drilling now because the whole program got stuck. Privatizations haven't moved forward. There's still a lot of monopolies in the railroad system as you know better than anyone. Uh, what would your ministry be doing in terms of trying to convince the government to uh, open up the uh, energy market for international investors, get state companies privatized, uh, demonopolize some of the monopolies that are keeping international investors out you know very well what's mm -hmm. keeping international investors out. And even though they're not completely under your area, you're, uh, you have an influence and in to get the whole government to open up more for international investors. What are your ideas in, to get more investors in, in those areas that have been restricted? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Morgan. Obviously the, uh, the other position as a ministry of economy is to support uh, further the regulations and privatizations. Uh, in fact, of, uh, in case of uh, the, the, the drilling companies uh, and everything, obviously the current uh, slowdown uh, is also part of the reason. Obviously, we see that uh, the, uh, it's very hard to expect uh, the, uh, the companies to start 
investing during the coronavirus there, but this is something which we will continue as a Minister of Economy to support, although as you, as, as you stated, this is not directly uh, under our uh, 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 level of control. But a uh, general uh, approach will be, uh, if, if speaking about privatization, is to make sure, I think there is a new team uh, in um, uh, state uh, privatization fund there, and uh, they are moving uh, quite quickly uh, to be able to uh, move companies that they currently have uh, in their list to be privatized. Uh, the idea which we have as a ministry there uh, that uh, um, as soon as they will be uh, taking out the pile of companies that they have in the list, so we'll be adding them with the new companies there. So there is a discussion uh, which uh, have been started by the prior government and will be continued by ours. Uh, what companies should still remain in the government uh, ownership there? And this would not be a huge list there. So this will be companies which uh the list will be uh, obviously voted by the Verkhovna Rada uh, in the end but uh, it's also by, uh, of economy and others and uh, we want to do this as uh, as appropriate as 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 possible so after that uh, all other companies will be uh uh, available for privatization but again privatization has been always you correctly say slow and we don't want actually to put all the companies into the state uh, property fund and they will be there like for years and years. So this is not the idea, obviously, because there is no management or no supervision uh, at, at that point. So we, will, uh, we, we are working together with the uh, state property fund in order to make sure that the companies that they have already and the assets will be moved quickly. Uh, through the process, uh, but here is one caveat, obviously, that the economic conditions right now are not great. So uh, the companies uh, there have historic problems, and we all know that. So they have lots of debts from prior periods and uh, uh, to uh, not necessarily done through a normal course of business, but uh, it's very uh, like complicated process to uh, pri uh, uh, privatize them at that time. But again, this is the uh, task of the state property fund as a minister of economy will actively support and uh, uh, we will uh, try to work out uh, different methodologies and processes that will ease up the uh, privatization and the uh, rules for investors so they will be more happy uh, to, to take part uh, there. Andrew, uh, you're a young IT specialist. You, you developed a great company. You sold it to Global Logic. I first met Global Logic in 2007 in Northern Virginia when they were a rather small company. They've now moved to the West Coast. You're now a senior vice president. This is a major industry moving Ukraine forward. The growth has been probably 20% or more. So you're a major engine of economic growth. Uh, Andrew, how are we going to keep the uh, IT growing at 20%. How are we going to keep it as a major economic engine in Ukraine? What is, uh, needs to be done? What does the government need to do? What are your observations about moving IT forward so we can move uh, Ukraine forward? Andrew? Yeah, thank you, Morgan. True that, uh, like I know there's many Ukraine more known historically for agriculture and heavy industry. IT is gaining popularity, hopefully it will become one of the things that uh, will first come to minds of people when Ukraine, they hear Ukraine. Uh, so luckily our industry is relatively insulated, right? People can work from home. So most of the companies, so pretty much all of the companies, um, Global Logic, I talked to many others, they transitioned successfully and relatively painlessly to uh, for people to work from homes and that productivity did not suffer so far. Um, so there is no immediate, the good news, there is no immediate help like the industry would need from the government. It continues producing, continues generating, um, I think, income and, and revenue for, you know, Ukraine, Ukrainian people. Uh, the, in the longer term, I mean, obviously we expect a slowdown, we already feel like a reduction in demand, but everybody expects that that'll be relatively temporary in our sector. And actually, if, if anything, um, 
literally six to 12 months from now, there'll probably be renewed uh, push um, to invest more into IT systems, build new applications, even for, for companies that previously maybe have not looked at as um, sort of IT as the major part of their um, sort of business strategy. Now everybody understands even more so than before that they need to be online, they need to have new, more digital ways to engage with their consumers, suppliers. So all that will generate even more demand than before for IT services. So actually short-term kind of challenges, long-term uh, it's, I, I, I hate to say COVID is good for IT, but there will be a, you know, increased demand because of the interest in IT. So uh, therefore, I, I don't think our needs as an industry um, have changed from what they were before. I would say, I, so I have a little cheat sheet that I, I kind of use on most of these meetings of my chances to interact with um, officials from the government is to remind that the industry is pretty self-sustaining and, and kind of drives itself. The things we need is like not hurt it, right? So uh, we don't want it to lost, to be lost in the mix where uh, if the, there is more focus on trade and, and especially, um, let's say if there is a um, company, uh, sort of governments uh, go a little more insular and more restrictive in, in their trade policies uh, and other things. Uh, industries like IT, they depend on openness of the economy in that sense, in terms of travel primarily of the people and uh, any kind of tax regulation, import export of equipment, because uh, not just Globalogic, many other companies we work with the um, industrial um, sort of equipment, software, embedded systems. So we need to ship devices back and forth, not for resale, but for engineering R&D purposes. And if those get stopped at the border, if there's, let's say, some kind of new regulations, whatever, they may have great reasons behind them. But for us, we're not making money on shipping equipment. Uh, so if something like that starts taking much, much longer, that can hurt the industry. But you know, other than that, just uh, let us do our job. In the longer run, I'd say two areas that we always wish closely. One is the tax policy. So anything to do with uh, sort of wages and salary um, taxation regime. Uh, I understand that in the long run, Ukraine government, just like most governments, will need to collect more revenue and then increase um, sort of tax base um, to in part to fund all these COVID related activities and incentives. And that's fine as long as it's done gradually transparency, transparently. So the companies can adjust to that and we don't become uncompetitive compared to a lot of countries in Asia that have lower actually price points for services. And the second is the talent supply investment in education. Uh, and uh, sort of the, that again, doesn't get lost in the mix, doesn't get cut, the funding uh, and priorities on education. So those would be the two things I'd say. Thank you for work with Global Logic. About how many people do you have on your, that work closely with you, your, what you'd call your consultants or your employees? About how many do you have? Yeah, Globalogic, about 5,000 people in Ukraine. Um, the other, you know, larger employees would be like in top five of IT employers in Ukraine. Um, probably top five, 10 companies uh, jointly would employ maybe 50,000 people, we estimate. But there's a lot of smaller, mid-sized, smaller companies. The best estimates is that the industry employs directly about 200,000 people. Um, and and by itself, but those are high paying jobs. So a lot of money flows into Ukraine, probably close to $5 billion today. Um, and uh, uh, the, there's also indirect employment, right? So there's IT you know, specialist is one thing, but then uh, there is support staff, about 30% sort of, uh, of our employees are non IT people, but they still have good jobs, good wages. Um, and then there is an indirect effect on the supply chain, people in like, I don't know, food services and furniture and office space and maintenance and, and all kinds of um, goods and services that we procure that also create jobs. So, uh, you know, and as you mentioned, Morgan, it grows. 
historically it grew about 20% annually. So this 5 billion can, and I, I believe totally will become you know, 10 billion within four years, let's say. Um, so it's definitely an industry to um, sort of watch and, and I think pay attention to. Um, and it's great, not just kind of for the business, but it does create jobs and, and gives also good jobs, right? And gives hope to people that they can do these more high tech um, sort of things and be part of the world economy. And then they go start doing their own startups. So they go into like local enterprises, but with this experience of working in multinational companies. So I think it's a great thing to you for Ukraine. Oh, great. Uh, well, let's keep that growth going. You're key to the future of the economic development of Ukraine. Let's go to Alexa. Alexa, you've been uh, involved deeply in Ukraine for many years. You've been a civil side activist. You've been a business activist. Uh, you, you've run the Ukraine House in Davos, and now you're the advisor to the minister. You've met with many companies. You've met with many companies who want to expand. You've met with many uh, powerful businessmen who would like to get, be in Ukraine. So what are they saying? Or what uh, have you learned from all your work with uh, the international business community? What's your observations about how to keep Ukraine's uh, economy moving forward with, and get more international investors into Ukraine? Alexa? Everyone, for being here today. It's an honor to be appointed to support Minister Petrashko and Ukraine. And given that our audience today is mostly American, I would be remiss not to mention that the minister spent part of his career in the United States. He also graduated as one of the top students in his MBA class at Vanderbilt. I look forward to supporting the minister in strategic communication and investor relations, particularly in the US and other places outside of Ukraine. Briefly, my background, I worked globally with NBC News for over seven years and at a London communication consultancy. Currently, I direct the Aspen Institute's program on the world economy. And for the last three years, I've served as executive director of Ukraine House Davos. In connection with the post-COVID adverse impact on all global economies and the new realities we will be facing, we view it as an opportunity. And it's important that we keep a fo focus on Ukraine's long-term strengths. These include tech and innovation, IT outsourcing and solutions, global scale food production, and substantial engineering and manufacturing capabilities and expertise. I mean, you've seen the Nespresso ads featuring George Clooney, but you probably didn't know that those Nespresso machines are made in Ukraine. The last time you went skiing or played tennis, you probably had no idea that your head skis and your head tennis racket was made in Ukraine. So these strengths coupled with a highly skilled and talented workforce, low costs and exchange rate stability have improved the conditions for foreign trade and investment for Ukraine. In the World Bank's Doing Business 2020 report, in fact, Ukraine jumped seven spots from the prior year to the number 64 ranking. This is Ukraine's highest ranking ever. This was just this year. A brief VC snapshot, for example, in 2019, VC investments grew 1.5 times over the prior year in Ukraine and reached 510 million USD. The top five VC deals in 2019 totaled 444 million USD. And finally, Ukraine in 2009, was home to two unicorns, Grammarly and GitLab, and one Sunicorn, as they call it, a soon-to-be unicorn, a, co a company called People.ai. So on behalf of Minister Petrashko, I look forward to working with you and in close cooperation with the 
talented and incredibly capable um, team, our colleagues at Ukraine invest, invest and elsewhere in the government to help you take advantage of growing business opportunities in Ukraine. And on that note, here are, are just a few illustrative examples of some dynamic opportunities. First, global companies are seeking to diversify their supply chains and Ukraine could help with this. And in fact, Dan Bielak wrote recently an article on this, uh, Ukraine as the uh, your next Eurasian supply chain nexus, and uh, it's highly recommended reading. We're, we're looking into this. Western auto automobile firms have relied a lot on procuring parts from China. In the post-COVID world, they may want to build more resilience into their supply chains. Ukraine has a large scale manufacturing experience that could be helpful. And it's already producing automotive parts for Jaguar, for Audi, for BMW. And thanks to Minister Petrashko's leadership and his initiative, I should say, um, we potentially have an opportunity with a multi-billion dollar US-based global auto entity to engage with investment into the Ukrainian auto industry and potentially other related sectors, among them aerospace and agriculture. Second, Ukraine has attracted significant foreign investment in the food processing industry, including Cargill. Ukraine could help other companies develop cost-effective, resilient food supply chains. And if land privatization moves forward as planned, even more opportunities could emerge. Third example, Ukraine is an important source of titanium used for example, in smartphones and in electric vehicles. Ukraine could help manufacturers diversify their supply chains for this critical material. Velta is a titanium company based in Dnipro and Morgan also it's, as we know, it's a US UBC member. Velta holds 2% of the global titanium feed, feedstock market share. And just two weeks ago, it signed a deal to supply 100 million USD in titanium feedstock to a company in North America under a five-year contract. Fourth, Traces.ai. It's a company led by two Ukrainians who were formerly with Ring Ukraine. And as you all know, Ring was acquired by Amazon in 2018 for over $100 billion. They were accepted into one of the world's best startup accelerators in Silicon Valley, and they have developed a tool to track people who have come into contact with COVID patients. Ukraine has a bounty of high quality startup talent. And by the way, on that note, Rings R&D is in Ukraine, and it's part of a track record of major global companies establishing R&D operations in Ukraine, among them Ericsson, Siemens, Oracle, Samsung, Snapshot, Boeing, among others. Minister Petrashko is focused on helping Ukraine make, ev make even more progress in these and in other parts of the economy. These are great success stories. And we will focus on proactively seeking out opportunities for targeted matchmaking, so to speak, marrying the right companies to the right investors. And we are working currently on a strategic roadmap to further build on that momentum. Minister Petrashko is also focused on Ukraine Invest and building on the strong foundation and that strong brand that was created by Dan Bielak and his great team. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this work along with the minister. So in conclusion, we look forward to engaging with you. We look forward to welcoming your ideas. This is a priority for the minister. Uh, you can reach Minister Petrashko at the following email address and I will be delighted to stay in touch with you. That address is ministryofeconomy at me.gov.ua. Again, it's ministryofeconomy at me.gov.ua. Thank you. We're very pleased uh, that uh, you've been made a special advisor at the ministry, and uh, we look forward to working with you. 
Uh, Dr. Singh, you've created a huge company, one of the world-class companies in uh, supplying the nuclear industry. Uh, you've been working in Ukraine for 15 or more years, even when it was difficult, you stayed the course. You're now building one of the world's most advanced uh, nuclear fuel waste facilities. Nuclear energy produces over 50% electricity. You're working in small modulars. The last time we met was in New York City when uh, you and I met with the President Zelensky and you were talking about all the great things that needed to be done to uh, improve nuclear and it's a key factor in Ukraine's future. Chris, thank you for being with us. Your, uh, your observations about uh, the nuclear industry uh, and uh, I know it's a, potential, it's a strategic country for you and a potential uh, country where you would make more investments. So Chris, thank you for being with us. Your observations about nuclear. Thank you, Morgan. And thank you, Minister Petrasco to, for joining us. It is, uh, it's always, always stimulating to, to speak to young leaders. And you are clearly a young leader. You were only two months in the, in the position. I should tell you that I have been in my job for 33 years. I have, I have run Holtec longer than Joseph Stalin ran the Soviet Union and Mao Zedong ran China. So perhaps, perhaps too long. But I have been in Ukraine since 2003. Uh, at the time, the Morgan is right, it was, it was a more difficult place to do business. Uh, but I have always believed that Ukraine has an enormous future. And I say this not as hyperbole, I say this as a matter of personal experience. You know, people may not know this, but the, a refugee came from, from Ukraine, from the Russian Empire at the time in 19, 1917, because the country was undergoing Bolshevik revolution. And this man came, uh, he was a Ukrainian. His name was Stephen, Stefan Timoshenko not related to the, the, the former prime minister. He, he was a, a, an immigrant, um, hardly spoke any English, and came to, came to America through, through Serbia. He couldn't directly immigrate. When he came, uh, he had a very difficult time. America was not as welcoming uh, for immigrants as, at that time. He was an absolute genius. To make a long story short, he introduced applied mechanics to the United States. He modernized the fundamental science of applied mechanics to, in the United States. He wrote some 20 books. They're still used today. They were written in the 1950s and they are still used. I had the whole set and you know, I studied applied mechanics in my PhD program. And I consider him the most consequential technical specialist in the history of United States in the middle of the century last year, last, last, last century. The man changed America and his ideas, he, he trained, he was a professor at the University of Michigan and later at Stanford. He changed the course of technical technology development in the United States. I worship him. He passed away three decades ago. I had a very brief opportunity to meet him. But what he did, and after that, of course, I was fascinated by Ukraine. So when the opportunity came in 2003, the US Embassy asked us if we would come out there and try to help the nuclear program in the country. I went immediately and I've been there ever since. It's been 17 years. And in the meantime, I can tell you that I have confirmed for myself that the country has an enormous reservoir of very talented people. Ukrainian engineers are second to none in the world. They, in spite of the difficulties they face, they are extremely well-trained, they're extremely professional, and every one of them that we have employed has been a success story. 
to maintain a, a an office in in Kiev, and that's been a that's always always viewed as a technology brain trust for us. I hope to expand it as we get into larger programs in the country. But my belief and confidence in the future of Ukraine continues to grow. I think the country has an enormous potential. It's getting better all the time. The leadership is more transparent today, is more responsive today. And so I am high on Ukraine. I just want you to know that. Holtec has been uh, developing a used fuel storage facility for Chernobyl. Uh, for the three reactors that were shut down. That facility is ready for commissioning. And then came this pandemic and we have been stopped for the past several weeks, but hopefully we will restart and soon we will commission that facility. And that will be, that is important for, for your national security because the fuel currently is in old buildings and they're way past their design life. And it's unsafe to have them in those in those buildings. The plan is to get them out of there into dry storage, the facility we have built as quickly as possible. We will will continue will continue to to help uh, the uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone people to do the actual transfer, but the facility will be has been turned over and will be commissioned very soon. Then another thing we are doing in Ukraine. Which, is, which makes Ukraine really the leader in the world. We are building a remote centralized storage facility for all of our, your nuclear fuel produced, used nuclear fuel produced at different reactors. That facility will be the first of its kind. Ukraine leads the United States and all other countries in that area. We are working with Energoatom to, to get that facility commissioned. We have designed it with the designer, license holder, and so on of the record. Our goal is that sometime this end of this year, we will have that facility operational. And Ukraine will not have to ship your fuel to Russia. Right now you're shipping it to Russia, which is a, a, a geopolitically, it, it makes Ukraine subservient to Russia. It's a, economically, it's $200 million a year drain on Ukraine's treasury. All that will stop. All that will stop. By the end of this year, the country will have its own autonomous storage facility for all the nuclear fuel that it produces. So there, those are the areas where we are active. Now we are, we are an energy company. That is our business. Our business is uh, to, to make energy, provide clean energy, to deal with any problems and issues related to energy. And I have always believed, I entered energy industry in 1970 uh, and, and then got into nuclear. But I can tell you that you can almost uh, do a correlation between how cheap energy is and how abundant it is and how rapidly a country develops. There is a direct relationship. Countries that don't have a steady, have deficit in power generation, don't have steady supply of energy, remain poor. Ukraine is at an inflection point now. Ukraine has right now produces two thirds of its energy almost using its nuclear plant which by installed capacity are only one third of the installed capacity. Coal, and I'm giving rough, rough figures, you know, for simplicity here, coal has two thirds of the installed capacity and produces one third of the power generation on average. So you could, and coal plants produce power at four or five times the cost of nuclear plants. Ukraine needs to become more nuclear. That will solve two problems. One, it will eliminate pollution from, from the coal-fired plants, which is a health hazard you know, to people. It's a, uh, no country wants to be choking its citizens with, with, 
with carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and so on. So it, is, it definitely will help the economy, but also the circumstances are right. The uh, Paris uh, Accord, uh, uh, COP21, actually provided hope, provided promised aid to countries that try to cut out uh, coal plants and, and, and replace it with clean plants. Now, Ukraine has done a great job with, with renewable energy and, and increasing the generation, which is, I totally support. I think it's a, it's, it's the right way to go. But the problem with, with uh, uh, renewables is that, of course, the sun does not shine at night. And, and even in some days, the sun may be cloudy. We don't get the energy. So power generation from renewables is sporadic. It is not consistent. And therefore, you have to maintain significantly more reserve generation capacity to ensure that you always have power. Now, in that area, we are working uh, to, we have developed actually a battery, which is uh, an aqueous battery. It's a battery that does not use uh, lithium ion. Lithium ion is a very good technology, but it catches fire in high density application. You remember the Boeing jet had a fire uh, some years ago, the Dreamliner. Uh, lithium ion batteries are excellent for airplanes and areas where you have small space, but for ground-based generation, where you don't, you know, it doesn't matter whether the, your installation is uh, 100 square meters or 500 square meters, unless you can afford the land. Land is not a big issue. For that, we need a battery that is water-based, meaning it would not catch fire, regardless of the, uh, the, the conditions. And that is what we have focused on developing. And we were talking to, uh, uh, to some of the people, I don't remember their name, in, in, your, in your country about further uh, taking that technology, that is something we will bring to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine can become a manufacturer uh, of those batteries for its own domestic use and as an exporter. You do have significant labor price advantages. Uh, your, your labor costs are a fraction of the cost in the US. And of course, it, it, is, it, it drives people like us to, to think, putting up the manufacturing facilities in, in your country. And that is one of the plans. So our plan is twofold going forward. One is to urge your country to become more nuclear. Uh, you are right now, you, you have a significant talent base in the country, nuclear, that you're gradually losing. People, you have a brain drain going on from Ukraine. People are going to Russia because they don't have work in Ukraine. They are specialists, they are very good people. And I, every time I hear that somebody I knew and is respected as a nuclear engineer has left the country and gone to Russia, it is not good. And we can fix it. If Ukraine were to develop, to participate more actively in the small modular reactor program, you will employ these people, they will come back to, to, to Ukraine instead of working in a country which is not particularly hospitable to Ukrainians. And they can help build the small modular reactor industry in the country and create an export product. The small modular reactor worldwide market is over $300 billion. It is a huge market opportunity. As I said, there's an inflection point in energy right now and Ukraine can get in the front of it. So I appeal to you and your colleagues to give serious consideration to accelerating the nuclear reactor program. Most of the money support will come from COP21. We just have to get your and of course we will invest. We have been investing. But that is that if I can give you a, a succinct message, that is what my dream would be for Ukraine to do. Become the absolute leader 
in, in, in the nuclear reactor technology. And I'll close by giving you a couple, couple of critical uh, input here. The small modular reactor, why, are, why uh, do we have small modular reactors? We have small modular reactors because first they are unconditionally safe. A small our reactor will not blow up regardless of what you do to it. If you give the keys to the reactor to a terrorist, he cannot make it blow. That is the modern technology we have developed. And therefore, a country that was the unfortunate victim of Chernobyl should never have a technology that will cause any kind of risk to public health and safety. And that is what we are pushing. Our, our goal, we are talking to the Canadians, they are very interested also in, in in our technology, would like to become the exporter of it. My preference would be to do it in Ukraine and create a, a, a center, a, a center of excellence for small modular reactors. And as I said before, a manufacturing hub for making the latest technology, energy storage systems consisting of batteries. Thank you. Thanks to you for listening and thanks Morgan for asking yeah, thank you very much chris sounds very exciting uh uh thanks for outlining all that to us and uh let us all know what we can do to help make it uh successful van yider you've been involved with the ukraine for 30 years cargill's been there 30 years you've been our executive committee for 20 years you're a major investor you're part of the engine of growth your views from Cargill about moving Ukraine forward, moving agribusiness forward. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. I'll try to be brief. I know we're starting to run out of time. Uh, I feel like I'm going to reiterate a bit what uh, the minister said, but I think that's a good thing because uh, for the last 20 or 30 years, I haven't always felt like uh, I was aligned necessarily uh, with the ministers, but um, uh, Ukraine has a, has a great uh, agricultural food supply uh, foundation uh, for the world. It's been an extraordinary story. Um, you know, Ukraine is one of the top six exporters in the world in wheat, corn, barley, sun oil, soy, rape seeds. Uh, it's really an extraordinary food supply country for the world. Uh, the, the, the growth in grain production in Ukraine from 2005 to 2019 or 20 has gone from uh, 32 million metric tons, the 78, as the minister said earlier today, and the, uh, the export piece of that has gone from like 12 million to 55 million. So uh, the ability of Ukraine to be a food supplier to the world is, is really extraordinary, and, and it's a real uh, credit to the farmers of Ukraine and the investors and, you know, the whole supply chain. And at different times, the government has done some good things through the years. In, in some times it's been in spite of the government and at other times it has been uh, also because the government has done some good things through the years. So I think uh, there's much to be proud of in the agricultural sector to get where um, we've gotten today in Ukraine. There's still a great, great future ahead even more than today. Um, as the minister knows well, as most people on this call know well, uh, there's, there's opportunity for greater investment, technology, sustainability, infrastructure, a better government environment to help agriculture thrive. Um, the opportunities are amazing for, for Ukraine in the agricultural sector. Two final quick things I would say. Uh, as it relates to grain export restrictions and so on, the minister talked uh, uh, earlier about it. Um, I've seen a lot of... Uh, uh, this issue through the years in different countries and in Ukraine. And I've seen countries really uh, do this poorly. They overreact, uh, dominoes fall, and one country's uh, fear and bad decisions leads to another country's and another country's, and all of a sudden prices go through the roof, and poor people, particularly vulnerable people, are hurt all around the world uh, when that happens. In the current crisis, uh, I know from talking to my colleagues in Ukraine, the, the, the government of Ukraine and the minister have done an amazing job of being thoughtful and rational and analytical about the issue rather than political. 
And they've, they've actually met with industry, as the minister said, and looked at the numbers and understood the supply and demand and not just done a knee jerk reaction uh, to try to protect their political um, selves. And so, so in Ukraine, the, 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 the grains have kept flowing so that Ukraine has been able to continue to supply the world while also protecting their local supply. You can do both, you have to do both, right? Both countries have to be able to do both. If they only do one, it's, it's going to fail both for the country and for the world. So credit, great credit to, to Ukraine for doing that well and to talking and partnering with the industry to really understand it. Uh, so that's, that's excellent. The final thing I would say uh, at the moment is uh, as the value added tax issue has been an issue for Ukraine for many, many years. Uh, it's been one of the, the biggest impediments to investment in Ukraine for many, many years. It's gotten better in recent years through uh, electronic refunds and uh, uh, making it more automatic and taking it out of the hands of humans who sometimes do um, wrong things with it. I would just urge you, Mr. Uh, Minister, to continue to be diligent in that area, uh, to try to make sure funny business does not happen in that area. I know it's a, it's a crisis time and, and when uh, political crises happen, sometimes things get more difficult but I just stay, stay diligent in that area. And um, I wish you great successes in your new role. And I know uh, my colleagues have great respect for you and what you've done in Ukraine. And uh, as a Vanderbilt grad, I'm with you all the way as well. So uh, all, the best, all the best to you. Some very positive comments from the IT industry, the international investments, nuclear, agriculture, your comments to these very positive uh, comments that's been made about these major areas for the future of Ukraine. Minister, your comments. Yeah, thank you uh, all uh, for uh, giving the valuable insight there. So, and uh, really uh, excited that uh, we have such a good uh, co uh, colleagues and partners uh, to work with and uh, to build uh, Ukraine stronger and to build the uh, Ukraine stronger as a part of the uh, US U U EU uh, community there. So there has been also many questions uh, on the Q&A and the chats, unfortunately, it will not be possible actually to go over them through, but also thank you all the participants uh, who are silently have been listening uh, and hopefully uh, they uh, received the questions. As Alexa uh, said, uh, we are open for uh, communication there. So and Alexa will be also in the supervisory board of Ukraine Invest, not only as a mine advisor, but as an entity which uh, uh, objective is to help investors. So please uh, invest in Ukraine ask us questions, we will try to help where we can, and we'll try to make responsible uh, decisions um, uh, going forward. Uh, thank you, Rob. As you've heard from today, there's a lot of uh, great uh, companies in Ukraine that a lot of people don't know about. There's a lot of progress, there's a lot of optimism. We've had a little setback here with the virus, but under your leadership, and with this great base, particularly in IT and nuclear and agriculture, uh, there's no question we can move forward. Uh, so we, uh, we're very pleased to have a person like you uh, who can not only uh, promote the areas under your responsibility, but in the whole government to convince them to use this strong base that's there and uh, with a few uh, legislative changes and a few administrative changes, uh, unblock some of the things that's been blocking international investment so that we can move forward. There's, you know, there's some of those things that's been blocking investment for years. We need uh, you and others to stand up and be counted and get rid of some of those blockages so uh, business can move forward and we look forward to working with you. Michael Dotsenko, my colleague, is monitoring the questions. Uh, Michael, what are some of the key questions? Um, I'll start with a couple uh, that uh, came in before the meeting. Um, there's one concerning the ad valorem uh, and the specific uh, rates of taxes on cigarettes. Uh, and I know the time is very short. Uh, there is now um, 
kind of an initiative uh, which contradicts the current tax plan uh, to, to increase that valorum rate, uh, which will probably start the price wars uh, for the cigarettes again. And so uh, the question was whether we can expect some support uh, on not increasing uh, that valorum tax. Uh, and hopefully this will have a uh, more positive effect on the state budget revenues uh, in terms of excise tax or or at least not touch it until after the COVID-19 has gone away. I can briefly comment that we had a meeting with uh, participating of the uh, industry uh, with participants, industry participants, uh, and uh, uh, there is a multi um, uh, multilateral group created uh, with the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, uh, some other agencies like uh, the, the, the law enforcement as well there, and uh, to um, uh, hopefully provide the uh, more transparent rules of the game for the industry there. So when we are uh, we have been working on this uh, for quite some time and uh, we will be taking it uh, cautiously uh, and this there are many requests from the tax producers and uh, traders how the industry should be structured because this is ad valorem is not the only issue that uh, uh, is, is being raised so there are several which relate to the uh, illegal uh, um, uh, cigarettes production uh, moving them to uh, other territories and, and the companies getting fines because uh, of the international uh, agreements, uh, the distribution and others. So we are trying to resolve it in an orderly fashion and this will not happen obviously overnight. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one uh, came from uh, Anastasia Pozachailo, coordinator of Spilnota do Pomohe Medicum Help Medic, uh, which has to do with uh, the supply chains uh, actually and jobs creation rather than the medical part. Um, is there an intent uh, on behalf of the ministry to support uh, Ukrainian manufacturers of medical goods uh, in context of public procurement? Uh, and also is there um, a desire to replace uh, some of the uh, purchases that are made in China, uh, which cause some logistical uh, issues as well as some pricing issues, uh, and then support Ukraine manufacturers of, uh, for example, reusable protective suits, uh, the, the uh, artificial ventilators uh, that are currently even being exported to Indonesia. Uh, any any kind of uh, support for Ukrainian manufacturers of those things? Well, uh, th th this is uh, I would comment probably from a little bit larger base because uh, obviously the Minister of uh, Health is uh, the driving uh, force uh, that uh, is responsible for buying uh, things for the uh, uh, for the times of crisis and the local uh, public health uh, hospitals. Uh, uh, as well, uh, there's a local governments there, so they decide and uh, it probably would not be appropriate for me to comment on the uh, what the treatment should be because there are lots of international uh, uh, internationally accepted treatments for different um, uh, for different uh, uh, health issues there. But uh, in terms of the support, uh, the general policy, and as we discussed, is that we would like to provide more support to the uh, to the uh, products uh, made in Ukraine. And this doesn't really matter whether the product is made by a local producer or by international company there who wants to work in Ukraine as well. So that's what we're talking about. And it should be, uh, um, uh, yes, we, we, we want to actually change, uh, modify a little bit uh, procurement, public procurement uh, uh, rules uh, in order to provide such uh, preferences for locally uh, produce or locally actually not only produce when the company actually pays taxes or how Ukrainian people working here they should have uh, preferences uh, in the public procurement definitely and this is according to uh, 
uh, we, we are discussing it with also international partners, so this will not happen uh, something actually uh, uh, out of the blue. So this is uh, based on the international experience, like it's done in European Union and United States there. But this is more broad answer maybe to uh, smaller questions uh, of, uh, of local uh, health uh, production. Ukraine has uh, several uh, health, uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies there. Uh, and uh, obviously we will support them as Ukrainian producers as well and uh, if possible. Certainly. Um, another question is from uh, one of our board master, uh, members, uh, uh, Mr. Eric Luhmann. Uh, asks, uh, in addition to the investment nannies, uh, what does Ukraine offer uh, to entice investors to look uh, at Ukraine seriously? Um, and there's, there was also a comment kind of related to this uh, uh, from another member of ours. Uh, he suggests that Ukraine looks uh, at uh, uh, changes in tax policies uh, as done by other countries who successfully uh, improved their investment climate, for example, India. Yeah, this is a very how uh, uh, you plan to attract. Uh, well, yeah, this is a very sensitive question there, and uh, as we know, there are not uh, there are many things that should be done in order to attract investors, and among them, the uh, general uh, economic situation, uh, among them, rule of law among them actually access to capital, access to infrastructure and everything. So we uh, will be working this not only a Minister of Economy, but this will be and has been uh, a policy not only of this government, of prior governments. So in this government, we will try to continue moving Ukraine uh, up the list uh, on all those issues uh, and topics as well. And uh, we also uh, will intensify work of Ukrainian West and the, the, the thing that Ukrainian West should do should help uh, new investors to navigate through Ukrainian system there because for every investor uh, new system is uh, an issue there so and uh, there will be people actually uh, who will be helping to understand and to navigate through different ministries and uh, um, uh, offices uh, to, uh, at this point of time, maybe manually even somehow help uh, investors uh, who wants to come to Ukraine. So, and, uh, and obviously, we will be doing this on a more systematic basis by changing uh, the uh, areas which requires to be changed. So there is big discussion on uh, IT with the Ministry of, uh, we have a Minister of IT as well, uh, Information Transfer uh, Ministry. And uh, in terms of maybe creating also some uh, additional uh, stimulus uh, solutions to attract specific sectors or specific investments. Uh, and this is what we'll be as well developing in the coming months is the offering incentives in the tax, in uh, regulations, uh, in um, export import conditions there but this what we will be developing uh, right now because there are no special regimes yet we are welcome we will be we welcome suggestions obviously and this is another part of uh, what Ukrainian West can do uh, to get the uh, views from investors what they need actually for them to do specific projects to, uh, in, in, in Ukraine there yeah. Uh, obviously, we know the general uh, economic situation and the, uh, uh, the economic climate is important. And as I said, but if there are any specific areas that uh, in particular are distracting uh, or uh, blocking the investors from making this decision to invest in Ukraine, to come to Ukraine, we will be definitely helping and trying to resolve it. Certainly. Uh, there were a number of questions about the uh, reform of land circulation, um, and some of them have already been addressed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there were some uh, that have to do with uh, small farmers uh, joining into cooperatives, uh, maybe attracting investment as that, uh, and maybe using land more efficiently with cooperatives rather than through large holders. Uh, how do you see the balance perhaps between the 
the various types of uh, farming, processing, storage? Well, uh, I, I think this market should be uh, is is already being uh, quite well uh, balanced. Uh, as as there was a comment from uh, Van uh, Urter uh, from Cargill there, so the Ukraine has been growing uh, significantly in the production and uh, has been steadily uh, becoming more and more active in international arena in trade. So there is, I think, a well uh, a sustained balance in terms of actually the small, uh, middle, and large uh, producers there. Uh, how this will develop forward uh, will depend on the market. So I don't really have a particular preference to see how this market will happen. Uh, but uh, what should happen, the land reform should provide opportunity for uh, more longer term uh, investors to come in who rely on uh, longer periods of, of paybacks. So this would include uh, getting land for more uh, for production or for irrigation, for example, there where you need to make investments and you need to know that uh, you have uh, ownership of the land or they have a longer term actually and more success stories, then uh, you can do different uh, um, uh, apple, uh, cherries, berries production where you also need the longer term uh, view there on, uh, on, on the land ownership. Uh, so this uh, land uh, reform, I think, will help uh, to get uh, investments into those areas uh, in particular. Uh, also, very important is to provide access to funding for people to be able to buy uh, land and farmers to be able to finance. I think this is one of the most critical uh, topics for Ukraine right now, which uh, unfortunately there is no solution at this point of time. Because uh, every uh, country uh, needs to have, uh, every company needs to have access to capital. And as international investors come to Ukraine, they normally come with their own uh, capital in terms of equity, but uh, they also need to come with the access to debt capital. And if we want to attract international investors, Ukrainian banks should be able to provide such capital as well to international investors there, because this is one of the key advantages there. If, for example, you uh, come to invest in United States, normally you have all uh, benefits of access to the capital markets uh, there. If you come as an international investors to Ukraine, uh, you also need to think about where do I take a debt capital? Uh, and uh, this also true for all agricultural companies, for all industries there. So we really don't have any, we don't give any access to uh, that funding to uh, producers on agricultural producers or uh, industrial production on a long-term basis. And plus, we all know that in order to make the decision, uh, you need to understand that some projects paybacks are over 10 year period of time. So you really need actually to have a long-term view and long-term access to the uh, to the credit on an uh, uh, acceptable interest rate, because otherwise your financial model, a DCF model or whatever model they use will not work. So that's why if you don't have uh, access to reasonably priced capital, uh, you cannot do long-term projects. So you need some other for, uh, uh, forms of stimulus or compensators there. But unfortunately, uh, the world didn't invent much uh, in addition to uh, there has to be um, uh, uh, low interest a long period of time of paybacks. That's how all the countries grew, that how all the investment decisions are made there. So you make several calculations and then you take into account like the uh, also rule of law, the uh, stability of your investment, the security of investments, uh, uh, all, all this. So th th this which uh, I think will be very uh, challenging for us uh, to solve that, and here we hope also for support from international organizations, uh, but on a larger scale basis there. We cannot actually allow ourselves to uh, have this level of investments into the uh, uh, into the uh, fixed assets, into the long-term assets as we had previously there, because we, uh, our, our companies invest less and less uh, in uh, the renovation there, and uh, I think main part uh, main uh, part of this reason is that they just cannot get uh, credit uh, for long period of time and for uh, acceptable uh, interest rates. So we need somehow to solve this, and here we hope actually support from international organizations and uh, institutions in particular. 
you. Um, perhaps the final question, because we're totally out of time now. Uh, and that actually has to do with your ministry. Uh, uh, the question is about the public administration reform in Ukraine uh, and how you uh, want to build the capacity, the human capacity of your ministry. Obviously, you already attracted uh, one person with very good credentials, talking about uh, Ms. Chepivsky. Uh And actually, I want to thank your staff. They've been very professional to work with, uh, which does not happen often with Ukrainian government uh, people. Um, so uh, how do you plan to attract uh, people into the ministry uh, who are, uh, as Dr. Singh said, uh, young reformers, modern uh, and professional? I think that's, that, that's a very good question. And I think we are already doing that. So, and uh, as you've seen, we, uh, I'm trying to maintain like the people who came already and uh, who are young and professional and who uh, prove themselves as, as uh, reformers already, because uh, this is not the right approach when a new minister comes and all the <laughs> deputies and everything are fired uh, then changed. That's not how it should work. Uh, obviously, some key positions are changing there as well, but uh, there has been people already in the ministry and uh, as you could see, uh, that, that can work. Obviously, this is not 100%. Uh, the uh, reform on the, uh, on the on the bigger scale, uh, how the government uh, employees should work, is underway, and this is part of the um, uh, labor code and the others, which will be developed further there. So the all motivational system for the public uh, uh, employees should be changed there, because this is also part of the reason people normally have to choose either they go into work in the commercial sector or they go into the public sector. So uh, without like properly um, uh, proper motivation uh, for working in the public sector, also for state companies, which are state in the state ownership there, uh, it will not work. So we had seen positive examples uh, on uh, cases uh, whereby such system has been properly introduced and on the results. And they have, for example, Naftagas, I think is a very positive result of uh, uh, the achievements and uh, the pay, how, how this uh, properly introduced system can pay off. Uh, but um, the decision will not come overnight. So we uh, hope still for young talent, for ambitious talent, uh, talents uh, who want to uh, change something. And there always have been uh, young individuals who want to actually come and work and change things. And we hope to create them a system that will motivate them to stay and to make uh, the, uh, the selection, the choice as a longer uh, career choice. I have to actually excuse myself there because I have to leave uh, like in a couple of minutes, maybe so one more question or I don't know. Uh, I think we're done with the questions. Morgan, back to you. Sure, um, uh, Alexis talked about exports. We can export a lot more if we uh, produce more supply chain items in Ukraine. IT says we're exporting, we're doing well, just leave us alone. Uh, there's uh, agricultural exports. Uh, Van always says we want a level playing field. Let's don't mess up our VAT program and keep ex export for ag open. Minister, any final comments from you about working with the EU, the Mediterranean area, others to uh, open up and reduce uh, quotas and restrictions to Ukraine exports? We need to double exports in the next two or three years. Your ideas about how to double exports from Ukraine? Yeah, uh, European Union is de definitely number uh, one, our trading partner at this point of time. And uh, we have a deputy minister who is uh, particularly concentrated uh, on, on the efforts on all international trade agreements. And this is one of his KPIs as well to uh, work uh, with European Union uh, trade uh, uh, to open up the markets. And I think we are doing uh, it, it. And it's not a simple question as it may sound there, uh, because obviously each country tries to protect uh, their own market. So it's always a balance, but uh, we need actually to uh, increase trade in general. So we want to export more and we want to import more. 
So that's why uh, this can be a solution. So we don't want to be only an export oriented uh, country there because this is not the right way to do. We want to be integrated. And the EU association agreement, I think, is very a good balance, provides a very good balance. There are still many restrictions uh, for us to supply to EU, and we will be definitely working to push them uh, uh, to open this uh, those markets, especially in the food supplies, in the processed food supplies. Uh, this I'm talking about EU. United States, Canada, uh, great uh, as well uh, partners for us uh, in especially in the post coronavirus crisis. I think there will be more and more moving to work offline and uh, IT system and everything. That's where we can be uh, uh, cooperating with US and Canada as well. The military uh, equipment uh, production of uh, ships, uh, the uh, airplanes in the future, helicopters. This is something which Ukraine, uh, we have programs and uh, we do have the interested parties from uh, US and uh, Canada uh, to do that. Uh, Asia has been traditionally large market for all uh, counterparties. So we'll be working uh, with them uh, as well. Uh, we need to try to find the right balance. And uh, the Middle East uh, is a um, needs uh, food security a, uh, a lot. Uh, there. So uh, uh, we will be participating in this uh, trade as well. If we are able to uh, find a way to coordinate with United States and European Union on the uh, global food security, I think this would be also very helpful because um, we, uh, together with US, uh, we, are in, uh, we are definitely number one global trader. Uh, and uh, by having such power uh, is in the changing world can be very uh, important and useful. So, and uh, that's why this discussion may go forward. Ukraine, I mentioned that not, not in this surrounding, but Ukraine is not a part of G20 uh, because of the economic uh, potential at this point of time. But we are definitely not even G20, but in G five in terms of the agriculture security and food security. So that's why uh, it would be good to find a way somehow to uh, become part of the uh, of this more developed uh, G20 type uh, um, member countries, uh, at least on the agricultural uh, front there. Uh, and hopefully this will also help us uh, uh, on other fronts as well. Okay, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, I know you're going to be working on our favorite subject to modernize the state railroad system yes, to make yes, it more yes, efficient <laughs> and to let international investors come in and to have private locomotives. Uh, I know you're going to be working on yeah, that, which is a major impediment to investment. So thank you very much. Uh, we uh, still have a few final comments from the uh, panelists before we leave. So, uh, Minister, thank you. We need to know, you know, move on to your other agendas. Well, final comments uh, from uh, Andrew. Any final comments quickly from you, Andrew, about, uh, and then we'll move to Alexa, and then to Chris, and then to Van, and then we'll close. Final comments from you, Andrew? No, very briefly, just as, yeah, I'm confident the Ukraine as a country has a potential, and hopefully the trade between the U.S. and the uh, Ukraine will continue to grow strong and also Ukraine will be in the news for all the right reasons, not like uh, in the last six months or so, because for us, once in a, you know, to mention, obviously, probably for all of us, you know, members of US, <coughs> UBCs, uh, positive PR around Ukraine is another big um, factor for our growth. So, and we all can contribute to creating it. Okay, the IT industry has always said, leave us alone, we're doing okay. Don't overtax us, just let us do what we do. So uh, that's the same message. Uh, Alexa, thank you for your comments. You brought up a lot of creative companies that could do uh, infrastructure and, and uh, supply chain. Uh, any final comments from you about how we're going to uh, tell the world more about these companies and get involved in the supply chain? Thank you, Morgan. I would just like to briefly echo the minister's desire for openness, transparency, and an, and an exchange of ideas and cooperation. And I look forward to working with all of you alongside our terrific and very capable and professional colleagues at Ukraine Invest. Um, again, 
please reach out to me, ministryofeconomy at me.gov.ua. And Morgan, thank you to you and your team for having us here today. We really appreciate it. You also are just for the minister. <laughs> we know how to get a hold of you. Uh, so thank you again for your work. Uh, uh, Chris, we got to follow up on your comments. Uh, you've been talking about this for some time. We got to get more attention from the government, more attention from the ministry, more attention from uh, the President's Investment Council. I know you've been a member of that, but there's so much potential in your area and it's so critical to Ukraine for uh, energy independence and to modernize all the nuclear reactors and make them more efficient. Many people say they could modernize the, the ones they have and, and have an equal capacity to, to new two new nuclear reactors, which they're never going to be able to build. So Chris, thank you for your comments. We want to, we got to do a lot more to follow up on uh, your ideas about technology. So thank you very much. And then, uh, okay, uh, Van, Van's, Van's comments as always, keep the markets open, keep a level playing field and don't mess up our VAT tax repayments. So, uh, I guess that's the same message that you've been giving for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's true, Morgan. I, the, my final thought would be uh, don't get distracted by the noise, do the right thing every day, stay the course. Um, Ukraine needs to keep doing the right thing every day, just like all of us, if you will. And, and what we try to do as Cargill is, uh, is each day try to win the day. So thanks for having us. Well, thank you very much. Our whole theme is moving Ukraine forward. There's a huge base out there. There's lots of opportunities, as Alexa says. We've just got to translate those into action and results. And uh, the little setback here, but that's only going to be a temporary setback. So let's find ways to move ahead. And our theme always has been uh, full speed ahead. Thank you all for joining us. Sorry we went just a little long, but a uh, very important subject. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for all the panelists and uh, we'll uh, all work together to uh, start producing more concrete results for Ukraine. Thank you very much. We'll see you at the next seminar, hopefully in one week.